Thank. So the next speaker, I'd like to introduce Chris Harbord, who is a good friend of mine and somebody I need to tell you a little bit about. So Chris actually worked a lot. He's, he's been in dig digital ag and agriculture forever. Um, but some of the big things he worked on early was policy actually for atrazine and some of, and actually being able to keep that for us farmers. Um, so I uh, always applaud him for that. But he was also the CEO of Agrable, which was a successful um, startup because it got bought by Nutrien. And now he's a CEO of Air Scout and doing a lot of other things. So he's also an adjunct fac faculty for ACES. So I want to really give him a warm thank you for coming. And thanks, Chris. And the stage is yours. All right, great to, great to be here and have a chance to uh, chat with everyone. Um, all right, so I titled this, I, I wanted to be a little bit thought provocative here and thinking about um, digital agriculture and, and kind of from the agriculture perspective, a little more of, of some of my backgrounds, but thinking about you know, the opportunities and change in ag tech, transformational technologies, disruption and startups and how all that stuff works together. And you know, one, of the, one of the things that's interesting about agriculture is it's, it's nuanced in many different ways, but there are always stories. You know, every grower, every producer has a story. Um, and and I, I have mine, and I wanna walk you through kind of what got me to where I am, because it's important. The, the context in agriculture is always very important. You know, if we look on Scott's farm and look back across the five generations that have been, you know, he, I'll ask Scott, you know, what are you doing this year with this? Well, I don't know, you know, dad doesn't want to do that because, you know, 35 years ago, this thing that we did helped us in this really difficult year. So we're, we're hesitant to move away from something like that. So there's both a deep tradition in agriculture that's very valuable because it's very local and it's very applicable to this particular piece of ground that you might be working or working with. But it's also a little bit of a hurdle to get past because as you're trying to implement broad sweeping change in an industry, um, there's a lot of resistance, right? But it's, it's not necessarily conservatism, it's just a different story, and every grower has a different story. So to go down that, this is a picture of a, kind of a role model for me. That's my grandfather over on the, on the left side of the screen. That's in um, the early 1930s. He was a farmer on Long Island, New York, a potato farmer and a lot of vegetables. New York City has a huge demand for vegetables. It's vegetable crop farming, that, that's my background. Um, well, he loved aviation, just got an aviation bug, and that's, you know, again, my story, right? Part of Air Scout, this, this aviation thing kind of stuck with our family as part of my story. Um, this is a picture of the farm, and the farm was right where this highway interchange is now, and you're looking back to the west, New York City is off in the distance. But Grandpa, he's, he's a smart guy, businessman, right? That's a thing to, to think about in agriculture, too. This, this is a business. We're doing this as a business to grow crops and produce, but at the same time, it's a business. He flew this area, and he picked this area for the farm. This is a farm that he purchased, and some of the farm ground is here off in the distance. That's some of the, the existing farm, but right where that interchange was his, too. Well, back in the 30s, he was flying along, and he saw where that highway was going to go and said, if I'm going to build a farm and I'm going to have this, and I'm gonna have to sell it someday, I'm gonna wanna get the most money possible for it, right? So he, he used that, what I would call a technology, right? There were no aerial photographs, there were no satellites, there was no Google Earth. He had to risk his life going up in this airplane that even I, I, I will fly in airplanes, small little airplanes, and I love them, but that thing scares me, you know? And to think that he was, he was doing that in order to get information, see agriculture from a different perspective, you know? And that's really a, kind of an interesting, and a, thought, and I, I, I kind of took that to heart as I went through, through different things. So, you know, my path, kind of leaving the farm, I, I came out here to do master's and PhD, and, and my master's work, I started working in the, in the mid-90s on radar, and radar, really rainfall, because rainfall is the ultimate driver. It's a thing in Midwest agriculture that makes or breaks a grower in a given year. You know, we're so good at all the other elements, it's really rain or lack thereof that Im Im impacts things. So. You know, I think the original big data problem 
is in atmospheric science, and, and I, I bumped right into that. You know, here's a composite of a storm, one storm on one day in the middle of 1995. I was pulling it off of backup tapes, and you know, five months later, I'd pieced together a storm sequence over several hours, and was able to correlate that with rain gauges on the ground. And I, I loved it. I loved the work that I was doing, but the technology just wasn't there. The infrastructure wasn't there to support the ideas. So in agriculture, we have these ideas. Oh, there's this cool stuff. We can see how to apply it to the farms, and, and, but we're kind of waiting for technology to catch up. But was it really waiting for technology to catch up, or did I not have the right relationships? You know, I was working with people in atmospheric science, but I was over in ag and bioengineering, um, working on this independently, correlating it with these wonderful data sets we had on the ground of rainfall and uh, measurements, and then trying to correlate those rainfall echoes from a, a complicated volume scan of the atmosphere with an observation on the ground. You know, so that, that kind of overwhelmed me, and I thought, you know what, I'll go a different direction, and I went out into the field then. So this is a picture on the South Farms of the Ag and Bioengineering Re Research Farm, and I started working underground now on tile drainage and looking at chemical fate and transport and the movement of ag chemicals through the soil profile um, to tile drains. And the red lines indicate these are four little replicated plots next to each other. I had piezometers in rows. I created a whole other kind of big data problem for myself in terms of thousands of water quality samples and time series measurements from you know, upwards of 200 sensors in the field at the time. I finished that and kind of went and I, I said, you know, I'm not sure that academia was the right path for me at that point. I, I wanted to, to go and make an impact in some way. And I, I went down the path of professional research, and Scott alluded to that a little bit. I started to work in the chemical industries um, to really start to determine these, these ag products that are out there. How can they be safely applied and used? And, and it was right in line with all my research and interests. So you know, we started spraying plots. I built these rainfall simulators where we'd go out and simulate rainfall. It's actually raining at six inches per hour right there, an absolute torrential downpour. But it's an otherwise sunny day, and you can't really even tell that that's happening. You know, these really interesting little small-scale studies. Um, and in industry, once, you're, once it's been proven that you know what you're doing and you do something on a small scale and you start to show results, it expands and it gets bigger. So you know, then we went out into California, and we wanted to do a study on a development, and these were um, uh, ant killers, sp spray for um, you know, home, home pesticide use. But we couldn't actually use real houses, so we made fake houses. We made six, of, we called it the Hollywood study. And you know, built this entire development in the middle of nowhere and uh, built a rainfall simulator across this thing. We had lawn irrigation, so we simulated this environment and then we did multiple applications. So again, it just kept getting bigger. You know? Then I started working in the Midwest on atrazine and looking at drinking water, and we started to see these broad correlations. This is a, an interesting map where we have um, census, U.S. Census Bureau information. There was a study done on um, just part of the survey was, are you getting your drinking water in a rural sense from a dug well or a drilled well? And we just looked at those numbers and started to see this huge correlation between the Wisconsin and the pre-Wisconsin glacial advances and the occurrence of dug wells. You know, and that, wasn't really a machine learning technique. This was just visuals, like, whoa, look at that. There's something there. You know, and we started thinking bigger picture. We moved from really atrazine moving through the soil profile, eventually making it up into uh, drinking water wells, to then thinking about the surface water applications. We started doing national modeling you know, on, on the smallest of scales and looking at where are these pesticides able to be used safely, this sort of thing. Um, and we did, it was a combination of field studies. So all of the light gray areas, that's pretty much everywhere that corn is grown in, um, with some success, right? And it was interesting hearing about sorghum before. You know, sorghum and corn, and even sugarcane to a certain extent, they look identical when they're, when they're young plants. And you know, we tend to see sorghum grown where you can't grow corn. Um, to the yields that you would need to be profitable. Sorghum is kind of another crop. So you see sorghum's more of around the fringes of the gray area with corn being in that heart with Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, that area. But we started to look and see these broad national modeling studies where we're modeling on a field level, but we're aggregating up across the country, correlating that to field studies, and trying to look at other areas that we hadn't monitored where um, problems may occur. So, you know, those. The pink dots on the screen, those are actually places where we went out and did actual monitoring studies over a course of years. And then the blue areas, 
are the subset of the light gray areas where the conditions are right for there to be potentially an issue with atrazine migrating to areas where you, you don't intend it to. And it was this, this, this discovery in Texas, which I hadn't even thought about, you know, and that was just a, an interesting finding. Well, by this time, I started to think I was, you know, really starting to think big picture modeling and having a lot of fun. And um, we started up this company called Agricultural Informatics, um, which that's a mouthful, you know. And, and in business, you realize, boy, a name like Agricultural Informatics, it was confusing, but we were having fun. We were still working in the consulting world, and we were doing the startup gauge. We came up with this product called Pocket Rain Gauge that took a lot of that research for my master's degree long ago and brought it forward. And this is now you know, web connected and um, mobile app application of what took me two years to pull together as a master's degree is pulled together in seconds thousands of times over for, for this app. We're happily going around this and, and trying to think of, well, what's next for us? How do we do this thing? And then there was this announcement. Monsanto buys Climate Corp for 930 million. And I had just a week before this announcement came out, saw Climate Corp at a trade show. And I looked at him and I felt sorry for him. I was like, oh, I just don't see how that business is going to come together. And then I see this and it blew my mind. You know? And I was like, you know, we have equivalent technology here. We have things going on that are different, maybe more interesting. And that kind of changed my world. And I started to think more about ag tech and think more about the startup world. And I eventually just gave up on the whole consulting career and, and moved over. And, and that's really the formation of ag ag Agribol came from that. So I wanted to think about this in, in, you know, in, in the nature of this talk today. I want to think of things and just present things here through the lens of agriculture. We have to think about that. I talked a little about the, the steeped history and other things. But I want to think about things today here as a transformational technology plus an acceleration. And you can argue any of these examples I'm going to present. But um, let's just think about a couple. You know? There's education. And then you add the accelerating technology of paper. You, know? you could argue that there's other, others, but that's, that, that's just a general one. Okay? Let's think about um, metallurgy and then the internal combustion engine. That changed agriculture, the internal combustion engine. But without that background and using the right uh, materials in which to create those engines, really, you, you don't have that opportunity. But the availability of the internal combustion engine really brought agriculture forward. Weather forecasts. I mean, we had this, you know, the barometers rising, the barometers falling. Um, but then when we got orbiting satellites starting in the 60s and had those first amazing pictures of, of the real-time weather, that was really an accelerating technology that created really so many opportunities today. Can we think of tractor guidance? Well, that's not a new thing. You know, I remember as a kid, there was this orchard that I had to drive through with the tractor. And if the spraying tractor in front of me left deep enough, deep enough ruts, I could actually kind of half fall asleep and not crash the tractor as I went down the row. You know, that's a form of guidance, you know, and it was there long ago. But when you introduce GPS and you broadly um, make that technology accessible to the masses, um, we really have tractor guidance come of age and we can see then what it, what it does for us. Um, cloud storage and computing. And we think about handheld connected computers. In agriculture, I, I can't tell you how important it was for Agribol and, and other startups that I've been involved in. All the growers have an iPhone. They're all connected, right? They're, they're in the field. They're never at an office. So having that handheld connected computer and being able to connect that to the resources on the cloud that, that you've created as a business is, is absolutely critical. OK, microbiology and DNA sequencing. Transformational technology in terms of its discovery and then what actually accelerates it. Breeding and CRISPR. Logistics and blockchain ledgers. Blockchain ledgers are going to upset and accelerate that uh, business of logistics. And we, we see this right now in agriculture. Paper, paper and carbon papers being used daily. The mail, like with a stamp, I mean, is a way of of moving um, huge contracts in the grain movement process. It's incredible. You know? there, there's just huge opportunities in this. So some of this is low-hanging fruit. And I think the last you know, is data and structured statistics plus intelligence. And I really don't want to discriminate there. I think in business, we have to be cognizant that everyone wants AI. 
because as humans, we're ultimately lazy, right? We'd much rather watch TV and have artificial intelligence figure it all out for us. Um, but I'm really looking for intelligence in any way, right? That's the opportunity is if I can find an intelligent human or put an, an intelligence into a situation around data and structured statistics, um, there's a real opportunity there. Okay, so what I, what I wanted to go into next here, there's, there's two categories out there. Um, you know, I'm talking about ag tech. It's been expanded now to agri-food tech depending on who you talk to. And this is AgFunder. AgFunder puts out a report. They try to categorize all the new companies and the areas in which innovation and investment is happening in, um, in the startup world. You know, we have biotechnology and agribusiness marketplaces, bioenergy and materials, you know, all these buckets. And then you get down to the bottom and it's novel farm systems and uh, miscellaneous, you know, in order to grab everything together, as you would expect in a classification structure that's too broad to really truly Pin in. But we start to see other things like restaurant marketplaces and e-grocery and home cooking technologies kind of coming into this agri-food technology space. And really, this reflects the way in which investors are viewing um, the opportunities. And if we kind of chase the money and look back, let's look at um, the ag tech landscape. This is another one. You know, AgFunder is a really good site, um, and they do annual reporting. Um, there's another one here called the Mixing Bowl. There's a lot here, right? But I, I look at it and I kind of squint and say, every single logo on here is probably five to 10, maybe even $20 million of investment. So we're looking at potentially billions of dollars, right, put into place here when you look at all these logos. Um, and the way this one's organized, this is by the Mixing Bowl, and Shauna Day does a great job with this and it's updated every year. So the 19 one isn't out yet, obviously, but it, I like how she organizes things here because it starts over on the left of infield sensors and systems and moves over all the way to post-harvest monitoring and efficiency. And then it tries to categorize different companies into their technology advancement. And you know, there's not necessarily a fit for everything, but you're trying to, what she's trying to pick up and what I really appreciate here um, is the, uh, the way in which ag technologies particularly are, are presented. You know, so here, here's a great example of that. This one right here, this, this logo right here is Farmers Business Network. Um, huge group. They're disrupting ag retail. They're coming in with price discovery and saying we're able to now understand what the cost of your inputs are for an agricultural business. Cost of fertilizer, cost of pesticides. Um, but here they are over in trading and finance. Well, they're a bigger company, they're doing a lot of different things in agriculture, but where they're kind of breaking ground is in thinking about how they're financing those, uh, those purchases. Okay, so I'm gonna go into a few examples here of some transformational technologies um, plus acceleration um, and, and go through three that are kind of near and dear to my heart. Planting crops plus robotics, and I'm gonna talk about that one generally. The second one, crop models plus 120 day weather forecast. That's really the core of what Agrable was. And then cloud storage plus thermal sensors is really the Air Scout example. So I'm gonna talk about those three um, in terms of those example, example companies. But the first one to talk about is planting crops and robotics. And this is, this is more of an op observation. Um, now I have two very different planters here. The one on the left is a Kenzie 36 row planter for corn and soybean and other grain crops. Um, it's pulled by a single tractor. It's got GPS guidance. There's one operator. There are those huge tanks in the middle, these big white tanks. That's where the, the seed is placed in bulk. And you can put two different hybrids in there. So you can vary the planting population, how frequently you drop seeds, and then which variety that you drop um, as you move through the field, all controlled by and pulled by one tractor. This thing weighs what, 50 to 70,000 pounds, just the, just the implement, and the tractor's another you know, 50 to 70,000 pounds, huge, huge piece of equipment. There are only a few manufacturers globally that can actually build something like this. But when we look at it, what I see are 36 robots, all hooked up to a metal bar, and there's a way to drag it into the field with a single tractor, and one person can do all that. You know? It's hugely efficient, optimal, optimally efficient for large fields. Um, and I often see in this, in this space of robotics, everyone wants to have this little robot. You think, well, is it better to have 36 little robots all having a problem? And each of these little boxes, each one of these little white boxes here is a small hopper that's fed out of those big hoppers. And each one of these is 
is a robot by all stretches of the, the imagination. And it does basically the same job that this does here. So this is one that you walk behind. So when we think globally and we think of agriculture, the vast majority of farms globally are less than an acre. You know? well, that's not going to work for a one acre farm. This may work. So the robots really have to fit in between if we're going to talk about it. We're already, we already have the robots at the big scale. We have the humans on the other end. So the robots are going to have to fit financially in between those and solve a problem. And that's just an interesting way to think about a technology through an agricultural lens of, of where can this fit in? What, what's the business model? How is this going to work? Where can that technology or innovation actually add some value to farmers somewhere, somewhere on Earth? You know, not everywhere can we have those 36-row planters. Do they make sense? Is there an opportunity for something in between? What does that look like? What form factor does it take? And there's a lot of smart people thinking about those things. But I do think that many of these problems, and I wanted to highlight that, there is the human, you know, just the person working the field. That's still an option, right, on some of these smaller fields. That's still very much so. So how do we use technology to just help that person? You know, is it simply a weather forecast delivered correctly so they know not to push that the day before a monsoonal rain um, that would lead to a complete crop failure, you know, where we, we don't even think of those sorts of things in, in the U.S. per se. Okay, so the next one I'm going to talk about is agribal and um, crop models plus 120-day weather forecasts. I think it's important to always talk about these companies. It's, it's not just one person. It never is. It's a team. You know, Agribal was a team of 70 people. Um, achieving you know, very, very straightforward, simplistically uh, executed pro products, but um, you know, very complicated in how you actually come up with those. But at a core, that's the technology, right? It was crop models that have existed for many years. And what we did is we accelerated that with 120-day weather forecasts to add some value to a farmer. And what that ended up looking like was that as a business, we had to serve two distinct customers in order to derive revenue from it. On the one side, and, and you know, I like to think of a lot of these as, as data plays. You know, data is so important, and you're generating data, you have data, but it's, it's figuring out how to put that data in the hands of the people that can make a decision with it. You know, we wanted to make sure that the tools that we built over on that grower side were partners. We wanted to make best-in-class software, of course, things that improve their efficiency, increase their profitability. That's what that software was all about. But then in order to pay for it, because of the farm economy, we had to figure out, well, where's the grain going? And who really cares about all this data and information? And can we make a connection there through the supply chain? And we ended up then finding the CPGs, consumer packaged good companies, and food processors became the customers that we serve. And we did aggregated data analysis for them. We helped them verify their sustainability promises and deliver ultimately on their brand promise to customers. And how we did that, you know, really as we look at this huge cycle from the grower on the left over to retailers on the right and the different steps that have to go through and, and where different pieces of information are created, so much of it's created with the grower. Um, the growers know that they're doing things sustainably. If they weren't, quite frankly, they wouldn't be in business. You know, they, they can't be um, sloppy. There just isn't the margin in it. So they have to really do things well. But they do a terrible job telling everyone else how good of a job they're doing. So what we really did with, with Agribull was pull that data and information into a tool. We used the grower actually to enter it. So we incentivized the grower to put good data into the system on what they were doing by providing them really useful weather forecasts and, and linked um, computer model elements. So what we ended up doing was kind of injecting ourselves in the middle of this process and connecting growers directly with US processors and then with these uh, consumer packaged good brands and moving that data forward through the process. So in parallel with the grain moving through this process to, to consumer products, we figured out a way to actually move the data as well along with it in parallel. So as the grain moved to the right, the, the value was added to it and the sustainability requirements actually of what that customer was demanding um, came through. So we were that connector really where the grower had lost touch with the consumer ultimately in, in, in how that data moved. So that was, that was really an example of, of technology. So you can see and just imagine how blockchain and other things come into these very complicated systems um, 
and, and the opportunities around that in terms of technology and also just operational opportunities. All right, so after that business kind of sold and, and I moved on, I, I joined a company, Air Scout, and really started to move that forward. But again, it's a team. Um, and I like to think of this as cloud storage plus thermal sensors. You know, that's really the accelerating technology for us is the thermal sensor that can take a look at a crop and, and come up with things. But you know, there's also this love of aviation comes back, right? Grandpa's smiling down and super excited that airplanes are involved again in what I'm doing. Um, But it takes, it takes a group. This is a smaller group. I think it's a more straightforward product than what we were trying to bring forward um, with Agrable. And, and that model kind of looks like this. We take airplanes, we fly them over farm fields, we collect images, we put them up into the cloud, we then build apps, and we train people how to use the apps. And then those apps are an interface. They're a way to actually push information then to um, application equipment or to agronomists. And then we're also able to push out to other platforms like Climate's Field View that allows uh, growers to interact with the data in different ways. But it's supposed to be transformational. You know, what we're doing is we're providing some kind of value, or these businesses don't exist. If the farmers can't find value in it, make a change, do something different, improve their agriculture in some way, it's nice, it's a nice to have, but it's never really gonna be something they adopt. So it has to actually solve a problem. Or if it doesn't solve a problem, at least identify a problem that can be fixed or something that's actually gonna cause some kind of economic harm. So this is a thermal image. Um, it's actually two thermal images of disease spreading. And I've got some arrows here pointing to an earlier image, and then 10 days later. And we can see these little red spots right here. Those are anomalies. In a, in a thermal image, difference is bad. You, you planted this crop, it's all the same variety. You planted it on the same day. You're managing it identically. If you're starting to see issues, particularly issues developing through time. That's a real, a real thing to, uh, to understand. But all issues don't exist through time. You know, at, some, at some point here, 10 days later, there's another new issue appearing here that you really couldn't detect earlier. So there are these opportunities to look at anomalies and see if they're growing, and also the identification of new anomalies at any time through the season. And what you can do then as an agronomist or a farmer is start to address those. You can say, well, this, although interesting, and thank you for showing me that it's growing, it's not enough of a concern for me to really go out and spend $10 an acre to go and address this problem. I'm not going to see that kind of economic return. So even the technology and identification of it may not lead to true value to a farmer. But I think you know, what we're showing with the images is this is massive data collection that can turn into something. And we can think about all the cool ways in which image processing and machine learning and, and AI can be applied to some of these things. But at the same time, the nuance here and the, and the opportunity for these algorithms to go haywire, and, and really the, the low tolerance of an agricultural community to um, technology promises that overreach in terms of what they can actually deliver. That's a big problem in ag. Um, here's an interesting disease in soybean piece. We, we see this pattern emerging. Um, when we see disease in soybean spreading, it's, a lot of these are, are blown, blown in, kind of diseases that spread on the wind. Um, there's no surprise that we see this disease starting on the west and moving eastward through a field. Um, but it looks, you know, when we start to see these soybean diseases, the best way to describe it is it looks smudgy. You know, it looks like somebody came in and smudged this area. And we can see this well in advance. You know, this is image flown weeks or even months before the actual disease emerges. So you start to see things early enough that you can actually do something about it. Um, and that's an important kind of technique. When we look at, at things like gray leaf spot, and these are real diseases that cause real economic harm in crops, um, we can actually see streaks of gray leaf spot developing from some of this imagery, and then you can walk out in the field and observe gray leaf spots. You know? um, and we can do the same with insects. Here's uh, leaf hoppers in alfalfa, so little leaf hopper bugs, and you can start to see areas where they are really causing some type of issue. And what ends up happening in the thermal image, it's just like one of us, if, if we go to the doctor and um, we have a temperature, it's a good indication that something's wrong with us. Um, areas of the field that are hotter 
They're under some kind of moisture stress because they're not evapotranspiring at the same rate as the rest of the field. So we don't necessarily know what it is, but we know that something's going on. And we can start to understand what that may be based on some other indicators in, in ways that they show up across multiple image types. Um, there's some multispectral imagery that starts if you take multispectral imagery and thermal and think about them in the right way, we can start to pick these out. But it, we're at this discovery phase where as humans, as agronomists, I can start to point you at these diseases and issues and what they look like and how they start to show up and what these smudgy patterns start to look like. We can see that. You know, our, our minds are able to process that. Um, the next step is can we collect enough of this to really start to train algorithms to at least prioritize? Imagine the issue of you're a farmer or an agronomist with 500 fields to look at. And I start to fly aerial imagery every week for you and you're starting to look at the amount of imagery that's coming at you, you may still need to review it, and you may ultimately want to review it, um, but it may need to be prioritized. And at first, that's the first step. Can we prioritize these images in terms of, on a given day, we fly 500 fields, that you're responsible for understanding if there's a problem, and if there's a problem, you have to get on the phone, call the grower, start to put a mitigation plan into place. Well, you can't make 500 phone calls in a day. Maybe you can make 10. So how do we at least rank what the top 10 most offensive fields are on that given day? And then from there, you know, can we start to automate a way to say this is an absolute problem and pre-talk pre to a grower in advance and say, if we start to see this type of disease pattern, do you want us to spray without your consent? We could get there. You know? But right now, at this point, it's just starting to emerge this correlation between diseases, disease types, and what these images are looking like. And we know as humans, we can do this. We don't have the volume of data yet um, to really start to nail that across regions and other areas. So this is a, an emerging field. Some like to think that we're already there. Uh, we're really not. You know, this is, this is um, something that I think is going to develop over the next 10 to 15 years. And this is an emerging area, um, not something that we already have and are, are prepared to do. So I think there's a lot of opportunity in it. And that's why I'm really passionate and interested in it. Okay, so with that, I wanted to, to go back to this ag tech landscape slide and just review that once more and show where all these opportunities are. So I talked about some just experiences that I've had and, and interesting kind of concepts of, of where that can lead. But this is just a class full of investigation, you know, just to, just to spend the time to do a Google search on every one of these logos and figure out what each are doing in each of these areas. There's so many opportunities for technology to play a role in, in what's going on here. And from the number of companies, you can see there's clearly the investment in it. And there's the investment in it because of the scale of agriculture. The, the incentive is there. The opportunity for these companies to actually make a transformative change is, is real. And, and the greedy capitalists can come in and really think about that and say, hey, there's, there's an opportunity for make money. If that's the reason why they're investing in agriculture, I couldn't be more thrilled. And you know, if, if we think about it from um, the, the concept of a technology play here, there are just so many opportunities for technology to come into this. It's just a target-rich environment. Um, I'm working a little bit right now on in animal agriculture, which is something that has been completely overlooked. You know, there's such a focus on row crop agriculture but in the animal world, particularly in, in pigs and cattle, dairy cattle is a little further ahead, but pigs and chickens, um, poultry, well behind. I mean, we're, we're not even, we're talking about connected barns that have all these wonderful sensors and absolutely no integration of that information into something useful. So there, there's just a, um, where we think of technologies in other areas as maybe being past agriculture's right now at a place to start to use some of these, even, even online, Sales platforms, you know, we all go, well, we use Amazon every day. We're just now seeing online sales platforms come into business agriculture. Right? That's, a, that's a big change that's happening this year and next year, we're really starting to see that transformation. Okay, so as a parting thought here, you know, through the lens of agriculture, I really think there's these transformational technology opportunities and then the accelerations that multidisciplinary teams can kind of lead together I think together, and what I really think the center can do is look at multidisciplinary productive disruption, you know, and that of course leads to the Center for Digital Ag, and then it leads to each of us and how we can be involved in it. So I'm really excited to see this and, and see the merger of, of agriculture and technology. 
I've seen success from it. I've been part of companies that, that are able to, to reap the rewards from some of that success and, and have had the opportunity to work with wonderful customers who are really so happy to have that opportunity. And I want to see more of it. You know, and I, I think this is the right forum to try to do that, the right way to pull that together. Um, a center like this is, is critical to pull those, those smart people from all these areas um, together, because it's, it's definitely something that you can't get your head all around. You know, I, I cannot get up in the weeds of the detail around uh, machine learning if I'm to keep an eye on agriculture, for example. It really takes, it takes a team. And I've highlighted that in the team photos with these different companies. Um, and I think there's an opportunity here to have those same sorts of teams across campus and across the different colleges of, of ACES and engineering, certainly. All right, with that, maybe questions? Thank you. Thanks, Chris. That was a fantastic talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, so you've obviously been on both the research side early on and now on the commercial side, on the startup side. Um, so. One question I have for you from, from the point of view of the center is that um, one, one of the major aims is to, is to foster uh, collaborative research. And research tends to look out five to 10 years. So we have a pretty long time horizon in terms of what kinds of uh, goals that we want to set, what kinds of problems we want to solve. But it seems very clear that in agriculture, getting adoption of technology is a very hard problem. And so, do you have any advice for how to take into account real world constraints, which in some sense are hard to project out 10 years while we're trying to solve problems that are probably going to be important five to 10 years out? Yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real problem. And I, I, don't, I don't mean that in a negative sense, right? The, the problem is that in, in other areas of manufacturing, and if we think of agriculture as just a form of manufacturing, you know, if I had a new technology some new widget thing that I could bring into a factory and increase the factory's production by 5%. You know, I could talk to the right people in the factory, bring the piece of technology in, they could pilot it somewhere that week, <laughs> maybe the next week, have it done, you know, and, and ultimately decide, hey, this is a good piece of technology, we'd love to scale this across our business, and any time in the year, I could start to be a valuable partner with that new business. Um, that's what investment, that's what you know, startups are used to. Any time of the year, they can acquire customers. Agriculture is different. You know, there's, a, there's a three week, maybe a four week window in row crop agriculture, and it's right now. It started two weeks ago, and it goes to two weeks from now, where you really have the grower's attention yeah. and really starting to think about new technologies and maybe how those can be employed. There's another planning portion in the fall you know, where you may be able to get some attention once they're done harvesting. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a real concern. You know, with, with Agrable, it, it took us two years to get brand recognition you know, as a startup. And that's crossing that chasm is a killer. You know, we're, we're trying to build a team. We're burning millions of dollars a year. And you're trying to um, get to a product and, and show that you actually have something of value. Um, and you're getting some customers who would say, yeah, I'd love to try it next year. And you go, oh, no. You know? What are, we're going to have to pay all these people for the next year and convince the investors to stick with us um, in order to pull this off. That's, that's a real challenge in these. You know, I, I don't think on the research cycle, when you think five or ten years out, the key is making sure that you have enough data to start with, you know, that, that we're, we're collecting the right information in which to do and predict forward where the hot areas may be and make sure that you have the basic information. Because, for example, we're coming up on the, the season. You know, if, if we are wanting to do a, a new crop and understand a new crop, um, Air Scout's actually looking at rice right now. There's a rice grower in the boot heel of Missouri who's very interested in working with us. Well, if we don't get out there right now, mm -hmm. we won't learn this year correctly, and then it's two years from now. So I think you really do have to think about that long-term cycle in agriculture. Um, even internationally, you think, oh, we can, go, we can go in the southern hemisphere and short-circuit that. We'll try to take your company, your technology, halfway around the world, and that's, that's an absolute way to fail, right? So um, it's, it's a challenge that, that I think the best you can do is roadmap a five- and ten-year vision for where you truly think um, both the technology that you can influence and really the technologies that are, that are there to truly do be transformative or, or um, additive and how to pull those forward. You know, that's, that's a critical piece.
Hey, Chris, could you talk more about the lagging edge of agriculture? I mean, you know, you were showing the robot, the big tractor, but that technology existed 20 years ago, right? Yeah. We yeah, don't um, adopt. We'll go back to that picture because it's a great picture. Um, in, in 1995, tractor guidance was uh, perfected, you know? Perfected, you know? That, Case, Case IH was the first to have it. There were researchers here at the university, um, John Reed. John Reed was a faculty member here at Ag and Bioengineering. He had a research program, 1995 to 1997. He had combines and tractors driving themselves to the field with no worry. Um, Case IH cut his funding. He took a job as head of R&D for John Deere. The university lost that research program. Um, you know, but you look now, it, it wasn't until 2005 to 2010 where we really saw broad, broad industry adoption of, of uh, that kind of technology, Scott. You know, and that um, is a huge lag in terms of, of the adoption cycle of, of some of these larger technologies. But that, that has been such an actuating technology in terms of the ability to then use things like Air Scout or use things like crop modeling to come in and influence these decisions on these large pieces of equipment. This is kind of just a follow up on that question because I know that I assume the um, the progression time for large pieces of equipment things change a little slower. We're talking about bringing in technology that you know you wait a month and you're gonna have a new and better thing. Mm -hmm. How do you balance not spending all your time trying to make things perfect before you actually deploy it, and then realizing that you deployed something that's old already and 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 not even ten years. You know, six months, two months. Yeah, no, it's it's a it's a real problem that we have to we have to think about in terms of software businesses and thinking about the opportunity to really sell the technology. I mean, if if I look at at Agribol as an example, we had three generations of software before we really started to get massive customer adoption within that business. The first platform that we built, and we spent probably two million dollars building just that platform. I think. Five customers maybe used it, and then we threw the whole thing away, and we started with a fresh new technology stack because we, we weren't able to scale it properly, and then we built that one out. And we maybe had 500, maybe 1,000 people really use that, that software and spend another $4 million on that. Now, yeah, we learned a lot of things. We built a great team. We were much faster at building the next generation, but it wasn't until that third generation of software that we were really able to do things. So that's a, that's a real and present problem in, in startup businesses. So if we can forecast forward and really be careful about the tech stack that we're picking and the technologies, even if they are changing, that they can be updated maybe without, with, without the transparency to the customer. You know? Because at the end of the day, what a, what a farmer's looking for is, am I going to be more profitable on this acre using this technology? And whether or not you're using a machine learning algorithm or you revise that a month later or two months later, that's not customer facing. You know, it's really exciting to us, and we get really excited about those new advance and advancements and changes. But to that customer, ultimately, it's the it's the result that's more important from that. Any more questions? Got one? Question? I have one. If you want one, <laughs> um, so. Everyone else that I've talked to in this area is talking about flying drones, looking for problems, and then coming in with big fixed wing aircraft and spraying it. Um, you've got it the other way around, and it's, it's very nice to think that, yeah, actually you have a lot more data throughput, a lot more resolution if you're flying a big plane to look for the problems. What stage are we at with drone application? And is that something you're looking oh, So actually applying chemicals with drones. So yeah, the, the drone, airplane, satellite world, you know, is, is something very interesting. When, when I think of it as a business, although I love airplanes and manned aircraft, I would throw them away in a heartbeat if we could. If satellites could do it, we would not have the expense of flying with aircraft. And drones, on the other hand, we are, it's, a, it's another cost difference. So to give you a feel like, um, just in terms of observation, a good drone pilot can maybe cover 1,000 acres a day on the best of conditions, you know, without 
having to stop on the side of the road and have a conversation with a farmer is like, why are you flying over my field? I'm not flying over your field. I'm flying over your neighbor's field. No, you're not. You're over my field. You know, you've got all those issues when you're on the ground with a drone. In an airplane, I don't have those problems. I'm flying at 150 miles an hour between fields, clicking pictures at 5,000 feet. No one can even see what's happening, right? So that's far more efficient. We can do 60,000 to 100,000 acres a day. So it's, it's like a 10x improvement, 100x improvement even, in terms of efficiency. Satellites are, you know, will eclipse what an aircraft can do. The problem is the atmosphere. It's there. It protects us from all these you know, solar radiation. It, it's, it's there for a reason, but it's really good at blocking light. The ground haze in the Midwest is a, is a significant issue that aircraft can get around. When we think about like application spraying drones, we're working, there's a company over in Indiana who's actually doing that. The first kind of FAA approved um, spraying drones, I think good for spot applications. And in certain areas, we, we have to get past some of the FAA regulations, which means a lot more trust in terms of the guidance systems that we can do this beyond line of sight flight. I and mean, that's a killer. I, you know, I, I fly drones around for fun and you get a thousand feet away, you're lying if you say you have line of sight and you can tell what that drone is doing. It's just, it's too far away. So a thousand feet from where you stand, you can barely cover a 60 acre field with that at this point. So by the time you get a human and a truck and a sprayer drone there, I think I could beat it with a helicopter that can land on top of the tanker and fly. I think you can beat it with an aircraft and a, a smart system that goes out and determines what fields are there. So it's, it's really, it's a business play. You know, if they made financial sense, they would dominate. And, and there's a chance that they will. Battery technology has to come a little bit further and regulation, particularly in the US, has to be relaxed. We're seeing more success with drones in China. I have a friend there, um, Zunrong Tang. Zunrong is, is just doing amazing stuff in China with drones on, on sprayer drones. You know, and they're, they're set up a little differently to do that and how their field geometries are. It's really, really quite interesting. So, yeah. Any more questions? All right, let's thank Chris.